Together, let's build a bond of love that transcends barriers, enveloping each soul in a hug of compassion and unity. That's because you don't have the right color of the skin. And I've been talking about this for forty years, all right? <laughs> and uh, I have seen hundreds and thousands of people who just become healthy and well simply because they are not fueling up all the time when the tank is spilling. In the yoga center, everybody eats at ten o'clock in the morning and at seven o'clock in the evening. Our lives are very physically active. There are no uh, automobiles inside the ashram, it's a large place. Everybody either walks or cycles. Even if you have to go to the dining hall, it's a kilometer. If you want to go to your workplace, it's half a kilometer, one kilometer, like this. All the time, people are physically active. So everybody is very hungry by the time it's three thirty, four o'clock in the evening, they're extremely hungry. But we learn to live with that because hunger, uh, empty stomach and hunger are two different things. Hunger means your energy levels start dropping. But empty stomach is a good thing. In the yogic sciences, today modern science also is coming in line with this. But what we know by our experience, you will spend a billion dollars to come there. Because research is all about how many million dollars, that's how it is. Your body and your brain works at its best only when your stomach is empty. So we always make sure we eat in such a way, how much ever we eat, our stomach must be always empty within two to two and a half hours time maximum. So we go to bed hungry always. People think they cannot sleep. They can sleep. On an average, for twenty-five years on an average, I slept only two and a half to three hours. These days I'm getting little lazy and speaking, sleeping anywhere between three and a half to four and a half hours in spite of the level of travel that I have. When I say level of travel, if I say my level of travel in the next few days, you will fall off your chair. Yes? Should I tell you? No, not necessarily <laughs> Because in the next ten days, I'm in five different countries doing I don't know how many events, <laughs> all kinds of events. So, you are able to keep this up simply because you don't over eat. It's very, very important. Everybody eats two meals. I generally eat only one meal, 4.35 in the evening because I don't like to sit in front of the plate and worry about how much to eat. I like to eat well. So, 4.35 in the evening if I eat a meal, it's only next day. Is this enough? Which… Am I looking? Okay, hello? <laughs> I'm not looking like your patient, isn't it? I'm not going to come to you <laughs> Because any correction and purification that needs to happen in the body, your stomach needs to be empty. It's very, very important. Otherwise, the purification on the cellular level will not happen. You pile up things and then you have all kinds of problems. The first thing is inertia in the body. Inertia means there are many levels of inertia if you don't notice all that. The amount of sleep that you have is inertia. All of you, you have come here to live or… Hello? To live, right? Not here, here, I'm saying to this life. You want to live or… The intention of life is to live, isn't it? But because you talked about American doctors, this is all being picked up here also. All American doctors say minimum seven to eight hours you must sleep. So that means one third of your life you must sleep. Another two, three hours, four hours goes in bath, toilet, eating, this, 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 you know. So literally fifty percent of your life is just maintenance. Suppose you have a vehicle, 
you have a motorcycle or a car, if it goes to service one day in a month, all right to keep it. If it goes to service fifteen days in a month, this is a nuisance, isn't it so? Most people have made their systems into a nuisance because their own body is a big impediment in their life. Anything they want to do, their body will not allow them to do. So in this there are many aspects. One important aspect is people are eating much more than what they should eat. Simply because they have been told you must eat more, otherwise you will become weak, this, that. No, it is the way you keep your body. A fuel… today everybody is trying to work towards a fuel efficient car, motorcycle, everything. This means what? If the machine runs smoothly, it'll consume less fuel, isn't it? So if you sit here and you are very much at ease, now it'll consume less fuel. If you <laughs> like this all the time, then it'll consume more fuel, it'll want you to eat. Compulsiveness will come about this. So, this new name, intermittent eating, <laughs> you should see, in the United States people come to our programs, our programs will run ten hours, twelve hours. So, uh, but they will come with some biscuit and something else. They say, I have uh, sugar intolerance, I have to, I have to eat. I tell them, you just be here, you're not going to die, I'll ensure because I don't want anybody dead on my hands, all right <laughs> I'll make sure, you first day, no, 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 I have to eat. By third day, they gave up all that, twelve hours without food they sat there, they're perfectly fine. See, health is not something you can do from outside, health is something you have to do from within. From outside, when something goes wrong, you can seek some help. But all the time something is wrong with you, this means what? You're a faulty machine? Yes, all the time something is wrong with you, why? That's not how this is designed, this is designed for health. Every cell in your body is designed to create health, isn't it? They're all working hard to create health, except you. So, minimum eight hours gap is what is recommended in yoga. Between one meal and the next meal, there must be an eight hour space. If you do this, you will see half your problems of health, whatever you have health problems, minimum fifty percent will go away in six weeks' time. If you do certain other things which may right now seem little extreme to you, if you have a little yogic practice, something meditative within you, then you will see ninety percent of your problem will go out. Ten percent if it still persists, we can treat it. Now. It's become like this, the healthcare systems, especially where there is heavy insurance policies. People are eating and drinking all kinds of rubbish, go to the doctor and say, fix me. <laughs> this is not how it works <laughs> She said, I hear that monks are looking for shelter in many homes. Why don't you come and stay in my house? Gautama said, if she's inviting you with so much affection, you must go stay there. Then people saw, see, he's gone. <laughs> Gautama, the Buddha, with a large group of his disciples who was continuously traveling, made a rule that during the monsoon season, those two and a half months, you can stay in the same place. The rule for the sannyasis or the monks who were with him is, you should never stay in any place for more than two days. Normally, the monks were sheltered in many homes, so this rule he passed, more than two nights you don't stay in one house, because it will be too much of a burden for the host. They are housing ten people, you don't stay there for a month. Two days, it should have been one day, two because you have walked a long distance and come. Bit of recovery time. But during the monsoon season, he said, up to two to two and a half months you can stay in one place because walking through the jungles of that region, during the monsoon season would be treacherous and many would lose their lives. So this is a time like that, they stayed in a large town and they were spread across in many homes. The monks went out 
to get their alms from the people. Ananda or Ananda Tirtha, as he was known, who happened to be Gautama's elder brother before his monkhood, went out and there was a courtesan or a prostitute in the town. She gave him alms, looked at him, a handsome young man, tall and straight. She said, I hear that monks are looking for shelter in many homes. Why don't you come and stay in my house? Ananda said, I have no issue, but I must ask the Buddha as to where I should stay. Then she became really taunting. She said, oh, you're going to ask your guru? Go and ask him, let's see what he says. So Ananda brought what he had collected for the day. Gautama was sitting, he came and placed it at his feet and uh, everybody is supposed to find food and shelter wherever they go. Ananda asked, like this, this lady is inviting me, can I stay there? Gautama said, if she's inviting you with so much affection, you must go stay there. The townspeople who were sitting here, they said, what? A monk is going to go and stay in a prostitute's home? This is it! This spiritual process has become corrupt. <laughs> Gautama looked at them and said, why are you so worried? The lady is inviting him. Let him stay, what is the problem? They all started getting up and started shouting. He said, wait, I am on this path because I see this is the most powerful way to live. Now you're telling me, her ways are more powerful than my ways. <laughs> if that is the truth, I will also go and join her. I'm here because I see this is the most precious and powerful way to exist. If you think her ways are better than mine, I should also go and join her. Because if you're a true seeker, that's how it should be. If you found something much higher, you go for that. Then people shouted and many of them of course leave. <laughs> then Ananda went and stayed with her. Monsoon time, because of rains it gets cold, monk is wearing a thin habit. So she gave him a nice silk wrap, he covered himself. Then people saw, see, he's gone. <laughs> she made nice cooking and gave it to him, he ate. Then in the evening she danced for him. He sat, watching very carefully that most attention. Then when they heard the music, this is it, finished. Things went on. When the time was up, when the rain stopped, when it's time to move, Ananda came to Gautama along with a, a female monk. <laughs> so, the power of being on the path of truth has been there but has been many times at its height, but never got mainstreamed. I see that today, because of our ability to communicate, because of the tools of technology, the natural longing, the innate longing in a human being to find truth, this is not a thought thing, this is not something that been taught to people that you must seek truth. It is natural for human intelligence to seek what is highest. If you are given an option, any human being, given an option, either to be here or there, he will always say, I want to be there. Right now he may be caught up here, but aspiration is to go to whatever is the highest. It is just that we have to show him that there are better highs than getting drunk, there are better highs than drugs, there are better highs than being caught up in social drama, there are better highs than being better than someone else. We just have to show it to him, we have to make him understand. 
there is a better high. Forever, many sages, saints, yogis, gurus have been doing this. But as I said, they were gentle people. They didn't have a voice like me <laughs> They didn't have a microphone. <laughs> they didn't have tools with which they could speak to somebody there. They could only speak to people here. In spite of that, they did tremendous things. For their times, many of them did tremendous things out of sheer grace and energy. Millions of people around them, they transformed. Millions of people around them, they put them on the path of truth, on the power of truth. But the time has come where our ability to communicate is such, we can make truth slip through every door. We can make truth knock on everybody's minds and hearts. Never before this was possible. Technology has rendered us to this place. I feel this is the best age ever to make truth mainstream, to make… to be truthful, to aspire for truth, to seek truth. The main force on the planet, because we have tools that nobody ever had. This is a quality that you will need. Your body says, enough, I had it, but you're adamant. This is Hatha Yoga. Your mind says, I give up, I can't do this anymore. But you are adamant, you simply do it. So Hatha Yoga is about creating a body which will not be a hurdle in one's life. It will become a stepping stone, but not a hurdle, not a roadblock in one's progress of blossoming into his ultimate possibility. So simple tips, I am not known for giving tips. Bad reputation I have, but simple tips. In the yogic culture, a shower, there was no shower. Bath always meant dip in the river. You always went to the river, dip, come out and do it. If you do this, your muscles will be good. So, an alternate way of doing it is, usually in our homes, the, the pail that we use to pour water is this big. At least it has four liters of water. If you do this, the whole body, that's it, always… I mean, I'm not uh, going to insist on this for the ladies, your hairstyles and everything, but always a bath means the first pail of water is on your head always. Putting cold water on your body will shift the heat into your brain very rapidly, it should not happen. So this is why those who don't want to wet their hair, at least should take a little bit of cold water and put it… You know there's a point here, in line with your ears here, at that point you put little cold water, immediately you will see a certain cooling happens in the head region. After that, you can have bath with just the body. But otherwise, you always… the first pail of water is over your head, not on your body. So what you do is, you fill the bucket and <laughs> that's the best way to do it in the morning. The, bo the body should be immersed in water, that you're trying to create a simulated dip in the river, okay? At the same time, the whole body should be 
at least the skin should be covered in water at the same time, not like this, 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 like this, 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 you know. <laughs> if you pour water, the whole body, the body should think you're taking it for a dip. So, if you pour like this, there is a certain coolness in the system and muscles become very flexible. Shower can do it too, if the shower is uh, forceful enough or uh, at least if the volume of water is good enough, shower can easily do that. It's always best that we use water which is little cooler than the room temperature. Just a certain volume of water to flow over you or to be immersed in a water which is cooler than room temperature. Because if this happens, one thing that happens on the surface is the cells, the epithelial cells will contract. When they contract, they open up all the pores. The pores between the cells will open up. The cells themselves have pores. We don't want that to open. That will open if you put it in warm water. If you put you dip your body in a hot water tub, the cells will open up and take in water. That is not always a good thing to do. You put the body in cold water, the cells will contract. The in-between spaces will open and that's important for practicing yoga. Because we want the cellular structure of the body to be charged with a different dimension of energy. If the cells contract and it allows space and then you practice your yoga, then the cellular structure in the body is charged. Why one person seems to be far more alive than the other is essentially because of this. And once your cellular structure is charged with energy, it will remain youthful for a very, very long time. When people are thinking, why the old bugger is still not dead, you still feeling like you're twenty-five. <laughs> Hatha yoga is a way to frustrate the world also. <laughs> so, water which is cooler than the room temperature, in India, it is in South India at least, it's not so much of a problem, the water is always in that temperature, ideal place. But if you're in a colder country, if you're in a temperate climate, the water may be too cold. That is not good. The water must be, let's say, within five to eight degrees centigrade, lower than the room temperature, not more than that. So if you have uh, a tendency to catch cold initially, first couple of weeks, you put a spoon of eucalyptus oil in the water, cold water and pour it over you. You will see your cold will go away, not because of the eucalyptus oil, just because of the cold water. If you have an infection and something else where excess mucus is being generated, that needs to be treated differently. But as I said, the water should be just somewhere five to eight degrees below room temperature, not an excessively cold water, no. If there's any kind of interaction, any kind of mingling and mixing of whatever kind, if you're in a crowd for too long, when you go home, first thing is shower. You must do this. If it takes three, four, five showers in a day, it doesn't matter. For a sadhaka, it's good to shower many times a day. You shouldn't overdo it, but 
There were times when I used to shower minimum five to seven times a day. Now it's come down to maybe two definitely, sometimes three. Two is a must for you, more is good. Any kind of physical contact happens with somebody, a period of more than let's say six minutes, if you're even holding somebody's hand. Before you do yoga, it's best that you have a shower. This is not a cleansing thing. We are not trying to clean the body, that's not the point. It's not because somebody is impure, you're trying to clean your body. Yoga is a way of organizing your energies into an individual. So if any kind of transaction happened too much, if I come and sit in a program, I'm not even physically touching anybody, if I sit in a program for two, three hours, first thing is shower. Because just the interaction creates a certain amount of… Uh, the integrity of your energy becomes little loose. So at any time, first thing when you go home, shower. Shower need not mean soap, shampoo, this, that. A bucket full of water, boom. Just water flowing over, it purifies. How does water purify without washing and scrubbing? Not like that. You know, in nuclear reactors, they're using certain metals, particularly metals like titanium and even platinum and few other things. If they want to purify these metals, they want metals in the purest form. In the normal laboratory process, they can only purify to a certain point, beyond that they're not able to purify. So what they do is, you make a rod of this metal and make another ring. Just move it up and down without touching, just do this, you will see the metals will get purified. So seventy-two percent of your body is water. You just throw water over this, there is a certain purification. Not about washing the dirt on your skin, that is anyway there, that's a different thing. But a certain purification on a deeper level happens, just allowing water to flow over you. Have you seen, suppose you are very tense on a particular day, when you go and stand under the shower, you don't want to come out, you want to just stay there for some time. Those three minutes or five minutes in the shower hasn't solved any problem in your life, but when you come out, it looks like it's gone. You're like born fresh. Have you noticed this? You feel it's all gone because all that's happening is, this is largely two-thirds of it is water. If just water flows on this, certain things will change. Thank you for devoting your time to us. Together, we can make a positive impact by sharing our insights and experiences with the world.